An extremely warm welcome to all of you who've joined us this evening. My name is Zoe Toft and I'm chair of a charity called Folio Sutton Coldfield. Folio stands for Friends of Libraries in Our Sutton Coldfield. I'm really delighted that you're all here this evening and I'm especially delighted to welcome Naomi Johnson, our, our guest speaker for this evening. Now, Naomi is curator at St Mary's College, Oscott, and tonight's talk will be focused on St Mary's College and, and in, in, in particular um, Pugin. Mary, uh, not Mary, sorry, Naomi also has another hat, uh, and that's that she is the archivist for the entire uh, Catholic Archdiocese of Birmingham. She might mention that uh, but just that it's actually much larger than Birmingham and from the sounds of it having talked to her it covers I don't know miles of the country or something it's it's huge uh, but uh, so uh, she's got a tremendous broad knowledge that she's bringing to, to tonight's evening I'll also just say that um, I'm delighted Naomi's a Sutton girl she grew up here in Sutton so she's got lots of lots of links to the town so without further ado, uh, yes, I shall hand over to Naomi and her talk and um, all sit back and enjoy and please do submit questions as we go through. Thanks very much. Over to you, Naomi. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, good evening and welcome to you all. Uh, I don't know if I should be feeling a bit of pressure having the largest number of people online so far, but uh, I am delighted to be here this evening. Thank you for the invitation um, and I hope that I can uh, give you all a bit more of an insight into St Mary's College, uh, into the role of Pugin at St Mary's College, and what we like to call the legacy of faith. So uh, as you are aware, my talk this evening is going to focus on St Mary's College, Oscar. Uh, for those of you who are Sutton residents, you should know the area. The college stands on approximately 50 acres of grounds on Chester Road between um, Aldi and Hall's Garden Centre. Uh, and my role at the college, as Zoe has said, is that of curator, um, which basically means that my primary responsibilities are for the cataloguing, research and management of the historic collections, oversight of the maintenance, restoration and conservation of the building's historic fabric, research and coordinator of the public tours uh, and as Zoe's also mentioned I complement that role uh, with being the archivist for the Catholic Archdiocese of Birmingham so suffice to say there aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, this evening's presentation I aim to divide roughly into three areas Catholicism and the development of seminaries, Pugin and the college and finally the legacy of faith. Uh, in order to explore the rich history of the college, which henceforth, forgive me, I will call, refer to as Oscott or Oscott College rather than its formal title, we need to take a quick overview of Catholic history, uh, especially Catholic history in England. Uh, so Oscott is a seminary, which is taken from the Latin seminaria, meaning a seedbed, and it's a place which brings together men for formation as priests, practice which dates from the 16th century. During the 16th century it was illegal in this country to be Catholic and priests were outlaws, thus the training of priests moved to the continent in establishments which sprung up to house and protect Catholics who had fled England. These first seminaries or colleges as they were called continue to train men until changing circumstances at the end of the 18th century made it possible once again to practice Catholicism in England. Catholics returned to England en masse with the first French Revolution when they experienced a second persecution and were forced once again to establish their centres and faith of education. Oscar was one of the first new centres in England, opening its doors in 1794 in buildings not far from the current establishment in a house which is now occupied by Maryvale Institute in Great Bar. The buildings were left to the local Catholic community by the last owner, a priest called Andrew Bromwich. Bromwich had been arrested for practicing his faith and was fortunate to be one of only a handful or never killed. He returned to the Midlands and his home to create a safe centre for priests and Catholics returning from the continent to gather and further their training. 
As a result, Oscar rapidly became known in England as a centre for the revived faith and the first priest to be fully trained in England since the Reformation, Francis Martin, was a product of Oscar ordained from the college in 1805. The college, still based at Maryvale, also contained a school for boys and it outgrew the site by the 1830s. So with a growing confidence in the re-establishment of the church, Thomas Walsh, who was the bishop in charge of the Midlands, decided to celebrate by building a new Oscar College. His plan was almost reckless and in a letter to his patron and supporter, John Talbot, the 16th Earl of Shrewsbury, he stated that, it is a most arduous undertaking the erection of the new college to provide a greater number of clergy adequate to the growing wants of the mission and to give them a more finished education suitable to the times and which gives an advantage that the contracted limits of the old college did not admit of. An area of land called Hawthorne Brook Farm was purchased in March 1835 and a local architect, Joseph Potter of Litchfield, was employed to create the new seminary. The site, now enclosed on every side, was chosen for its remote spaciousness and was described by a student of the time thus. There was hardly for miles around a human habitation. Neither was there a tree to be seen, save for an old and shapen thorn, commonly called the beggar's bush, which serves as a forlorn landmark to the traveller on his weary trek across the lonely waste of Sutton Coldfield. Joseph Potter was, until Puget Inn's arrival on the architectural scene, the man to go to for ecclesiastical buildings in the Midlands, although he mainly did repairs and not construction for new buildings. Potter was already in his late 70s when he was commissioned to build Oscott, and his commission appears to have been secured by his friendship with Dr Kirk, who was a former student of the old college and a substantial benefactor who had considerable sway over the bishop. The original estimate of the building costs was £19,045, 16 shillings and three pence. However, Potter's practice was outdated and as he acted as an architect, clerk of works and a contractor, a method which was both confusing and unheard of by this point in history. The contract was therefore far from successful and when Pugin came to the college in 1837, it was the beginning of the end for Joseph Potter. Despite Pugin's presence at the college, it was almost another two years before Potter was released from the contract. Ultimately, the young and untried Pugin couldn't have managed a project which was ultimately worth over £25,000. Although by the time Pugin left Oscott, two years later, this was no longer the case. When Potter left the site, the building shell was complete and the fittings were well underway. Now, forgive me, it's at this point that we have to pause and divert the story somewhat in order to introduce uh, Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin. And in order to fully comprehend what to owe Pugin at this stage, we have to look back on his life. Pugin was born into an unusual family, and it was always clear that he was never going to follow the social norms. His mother was from a well-to-do family, whilst his father was an artist who had escaped the French Revolution. He grew up in a world of contrasts, the wealth of his mother allowing them to live a good, if not extravagant lifestyle, whereas his father's artistic tendencies led to flights of fancy, fancy and spontaneous sketching trips back to his beloved homeland of France. By the time Pugin was a teenager, he had an extensive but far from standard education and a religious upbringing in the strict style of Protestant low church, which was as far from the wondrous faith of the medieval buildings which inspired him as possible. At the age of 18, Pugin began working in the theatres of London. Renowned for their loose morals, it's unsurprising that Pugin dabbled and his dalliance led to a pregnancy. He married Anne at the age of 19, but it was to be a brief marriage as she died in childbirth, leaving behind their daughter. It was the start of two years of tragedy in which he then lost his father and mother. And this is the turning point in Pugin's story, about, and about the same time Oscar enters in. Disillusioned with society and with an aching gap left uh, in his life by his parents and his wife, Pugin turned to the one thing which had always sustained him, 
Gothic architecture. He embraced the Gothic world in a way which he had never so, done so before and was embracing it. And by embracing it, he, forgive me, he embraced the Gothic world in a way which he had never done so before. And by embracing all that it stood for, it meant rejecting the Reformation and all that it stood for and became Catholic. He became a Catholic in the 1830s and Pugin was marking himself as an outsider and revolutionary by doing so. But despite the dangers he faced, the rewards came in the form of the friendship of, with some of England's most influential individuals, most notably John Talbot, 16th Earl of Shrewsbury. Pugin had published writings on his view, which had come on his views of Gothic architecture, which had come to the attention of a priest by the name of Daniel Rock. Rock was the personal confessor and priest of the 16th Earl. He agreed with Pugin's views and invited him up to Staffordshire to meet him and the Earl, and therein the friendship and patronage of the Shrewsbury uh, Earl and Pugin was formed. Pugin was asked to redesign some of Shrewsbury's home at Olsen Castle when Oscott College was in the process of being built. Shrewsbury was a primary benefactor of the college and a good friend of the bishop, so it's unsurprising that it took little persuasion for Walsh to accept Shrewsbury's proposition that Pugin was the man they wanted to decorate the chapel. Visitors who enter the chapel today will see it much as Pugin left it. Pugin was working in the drab, cheerless world of the industrial Victorian cities when he realised the power and colour of imagery in stirring people's hearts in, and inspiring them. Despite the excitement Pugin must have felt about being involved in the most ambitious Catholic building then under construction in England, he must also have felt confined by Potter's classical composition, which was so far removed from the picturesque medieval buildings he wanted his work to emulate. Nevertheless, in those early days of his career, his taste was sufficiently eclectic and eccentric enough to overcome the classical composition he was working with. Mixing Baroque altar rails, stalls and candelabra with true Gothic pulpit design and altar ensemble. His bill in 1838 for the furnishing of the college chapel was the enormous sum of 2,575 pounds, three shillings and three pence the equivalent of building and furnishing a parish church at that time. The college was already in debt due to the overspend by Potter and the majority of Pugin's costs were covered by Shrewsbury himself, who was not only patron of the college, but Pugin's sole benefactor. The chapel, despite later repairs and rearrangements, remains to be one of Pugin's most exciting and refreshing interiors. It's also a testament to the relationship Pugin built in the Midlands. As he persuaded industrialists such as John Hardman, George Myers and Herbert Minton to join his vision. The chapel boasts some of the earliest examples of workmanship by these key figures, but also later additions by the same families, providing a tactile and tangible reference to Pugin's legacy and the strength of the friendships forged between the college and those who worked for it. A quote from Pugin in 1851 said a few years after his work at Oscott, could, however, be easily applied to his time and his vision for the college. I quote, I am a builder up of men's minds and ideas, as well as material edifices, and there is an immense work and moral foundation required before they are prepared to receive, understand, and practically realise the glories of Christian art. The chapel story is, however, one of contradictions. Despite being the showpiece of Catholic faith for Pugin, from, whom, from which he won numerous commissions, it's also one of his forgotten works. This may in part be due to the fact that he did not design and build the chapel, and also that the college is not a public building, and thus has remained relatively hidden. Whatever the reason, the history which has been revived is often full of half truths, with key names being overlooked as much as Pugin was for many years. One of these key names is the maker of Chapel's main windows, which a gentleman called William Warrington based in London. Warrington was a vital figure in the revival of medieval stained glass making methods, which Pugin felt to be so important in his reanimation of the Gothic style. 
three apse windows were designed by Pugin and portray the Virgin Mary, crowned as Queen of Heaven, bearing the infant Christ. She is flanked by St. Catherine of Alexandria, St. Cecilia, St. Gregory the Great, and St. Thomas Becket. Sadly, Warrington's contribution to the college is often overlooked, despite the fact that he remained a key contract, uh, contact of Pugin's for many years. His absence from the history books is due to the leading role Pugin took in persuading John Hardman to start producing stained glass, as well as religious brasses. Some of Hardman's earliest stained glass is located in the chapel, and the famous friendship between Pugin and Hardman makes for a more compelling uh, historic tale than the genuine skills of Warrington. Nevertheless, it is Warrington's windows which take the visitor's breath away, and which still remains a central place to the chapel inspiring visitors and seminarians alike. Similarly, the story of Minton and Pugin has also been twisted through the years to downplay Minton's own genius. Minton floor tiles are world renowned, but there's always been an inaccuracy that it was Pugin who provided the technical know-how to Minton to revive the art of encaustic floor tiles. In truth, Pugin was lucky. Minton had been interested in renewing this last art form and had already mastered the complex skills needed in order to produce these tiles. Pugin simply provided the canvas for Minton to decorate. Historians have often claimed that Minton and Pugin had no relationship until 1842, but this makes little sense and records show that Pugin had nothing to do with the college's decoration at a late 1841. There are letters between the two men dating to the early 1840s, suggesting contact had been made prior to that. And Pugin also wrote to Dr. Rock that he would have a sample tile to show him when he next visited in early 1840, suggesting that production was already underway for the chapel floor. A number of the college tiles are unique to the building, designed by uh, Pugin and not found anywhere else. Equally, many of the floor tiles are found in many of Pugin's other projects. Nevertheless, no less than 15, tiles can be, 15 tile designs can be found in the chapel, chantry, a main entrance of the college. And given the college's dedication to St. Mary, it's not surprising that many of the tiles in some way incorporate the fleur de lis. One of the most commonly associated symbols for Our Lady in the Catholic Church. The college also houses some of the original encaustic floor tiles, which Pugin purchased as a point of reference from both France and Oxford. Whilst there are some similarities, it is clear that Pugin took the old style and worked with Minton to move it forward in his own unique fashion. Tiles were made bigger, colours brighter, and designs more elaborate. There is little proof more convincing in my mind of the strength of the relationships Pugin built whilst at the college than the fact that the original patterns and cases for the college's tiles have been retained for over 150 years by Minter, which came in very handy when a small number of the chapel tiles needed replacing in 1997. It would appear that the only story of Pugin's remarkable business connections, which is halfway accurate, is that of the amazing friendship between himself and Hardman. Although the start of that story needs a little bit of clarification too. It is often said that Pugin introduced Hardman to Oscott, but as a prominent Catholic family in Birmingham, the Hardmans were actually early financial supporters of the new seminary. Hardman's original business connection with Oscott was metalwork, although not the church furnishings, which they subsequently became known for. It was only after Pugin persuaded them to expand the company's focus, sorry, it was only after Pugin persuaded them to expand that the company's focus shifted to the business most people know them for today. What's been lost in the telling is the inclusion of the decorating side of the Hardman Church furnishing business, and that it was they who were responsible for repainting the college chapel in, 18, in 1846 and again in 1850. The development of Hardman into the manufacture of stained glass was a retrospective in terms of their connection with the college, and those windows which we have were installed long after Pugin had left. However, the chapel is awash with the brass and silverware that Pugin designed for the college and made, was made by Hardman. Chalices, thuribles, and candlesticks abound, and even the striking lectern, which is a later addition to the college, 
is from one of Pugin's early designs. On the altar, uh, on the Remidos, are six large candlesticks, four of which Pugin himself paid for as an act of thanks to God. Story goes that whilst out in his small fishing boat one weekend, he was caught in a storm. Fearing for his life, he prayed to God that if he was spared, he would make a dedication to him in thanks. Pugin survived, and four of the candlesticks were commissioned, each with the light, lightning bolt etched on the base in recognition. Hardman made and gifted the other two candlesticks at the same time. Despite all the mistellings of the development of the chapel legacy of Pugin on the college, the chapel does remain the beating heart of the seminary and one of our most tangible connections to this unique individual. The chapel is used day in, day out, for mass and prayers, and has been the inspiration and shelter for Victorian schoolboys, staff, family, and visitors, and for all the generations who have enriched the life at Oscott. Eugene's legacy on the Catholic faith in England can be directly correlated to his work at Oscott. It was far it was, uh, forgive me, it was from Oscar Hertz that Pugin's most significant Catholic patronage links were made. It began in 1837 when he first visited Oscar and met Bishop Walsh and Father Spencer. And by June, he was working on the chapel. And by August, he was making an architectural tour with the president, Dr. Henry Weedle. In October of that year, as a result of his work and friendship with the Midland priests, he was introduced to Thomas Griffiths, the Vicar Apostolic of the London District. And after a round of dinners where he met some of the most in influential Catholic families and priests in the country, he had secured the commission for St George's Southern, and his name was quickly synonymous with the regeneration of the Catholic faith in England. The friendships he made with Minton, Hardman and George Myers, who recreated all the Gothic woodwork detail the infusion desired, was completing Oscar, we were ensured that in his short lifetime he would produce a catalogue of works that could barely be rivaled. His determination to rebuild England resulted in designing, building, and altering and decorating no less than 91 major buildings in England, encompassing churches, presbyteries, schools, and public buildings, and at least 18 further commissions were made in Ireland. His vision was all encompassing and his belief in the values of medieval England and the architecture which it represented could, he felt could rebuild England's morality. And it was a vision that was certainly taken up by many others. Oscott was the grounding for his success. If I may indulge you all with a metaphor, the college was the soil in which Pugin planted the roots for his mighty oak to grow. And throughout his own lifetime, he would ensure that he was never to be forgotten. His dedication to the site, which launched his career, led to later additions at the college being undertaken by his son, Edward Pugin, and his nephew, John Hardman Powell. But his name was also to become known outside of Catholic circles as a result of his time at Oscott. He shared his energetic zeal of the re-establishment of what he deemed the true fruit uh, what he deemed true Christian architecture with the students uh, and he lectured them informally until he was granted the type he saw a professor of ecclesiastical art and architecture as a result. His lectures were published first in his book Contrasts and then later in 1841 in the book True Principles. Whilst his architectural glory should well be remembered, Pugin's legacy to the Catholic faith was left in another form at the college. As I previously mentioned, Pugin lived at Oscott on and off until 1842. And when not engaged with the decoration of the chapel or giving lectures, he began to establish the college museum. He had a twofold aim. Firstly, it was a means of preserving and displaying objects of Christian art, mainly from the medieval period for the benefit of college members and their visitors. Secondly, it was to inspire visitors to an appreciation and understanding of the Christian message that objects reflected. By entering into the imaginative world of Christian art, the visitor could be brought to a deeper appreciation of the faith that inspired it. 
a letter which Pugin wrote to his friend in June 1839 as, as to his endeavour is somewhat revealing uh, in what he wrote. We shall have a school of art at Oscott after the vacation and a very interesting ecclesiastical museum, which I shall be arranging during the vacation. To these, any of the boys in the school may have access at stage appearance and under certain regulations. I hope great things from these, as I think it will inspire the rising generation with true taste and make them duly appreciate the works of their Catholic ancestors. I hope they will profit much from all these restorations. Each in their respective states may do much for future times. The greater part of the present generation are sunk in hopeless apathy or decided bad taste, but much may be done by the rising youth. Every effort should be directed to them. I leave it to you to decide whether the sentiment of decided bad taste is as true now as they were then. Pugin brought to Oscott not only antique furniture and books, but architectural and decorative details to illustrate his lectures and enlighten the students. Museums of architectural fragments, casts and prints were not only essential to ensure correct medieval details, but also were working aid to Pugin's practice. It was only by such careful study of these authorities that the decorative world of medieval ages could be reanimated. Many of these fragments had been acquired during Pugin's trips to the continent. Rescuing pieces from ransacked churches that had uh, suffered during the Continental Reformation and from anti architectural antique dealers. He was not, contrary to popular belief, a scrupulous man. If he wanted something, he would find a way to get it. One such tale is that whilst on a trip to France, he heard of a gentleman who had collected a remarkable selection of stained glass fragments. Knowing he would be unable to persuade the gentleman to part with any of his collection, Fusion went to the house after the gentleman had left for his club to charm the man's wife whilst he, a hired hand helped himself to several choice pieces of glass. By the time the theft was realised, Fusion was long gone and back in England. I'm fairly certain our collection doesn't harbour these particular fragments, but I'm under no illusion that some of the pieces are probably less than honourably come by. Having said that, the vestment collection at Oscott is there mainly due to the thanks to the deep pockets of the Earl of Shrewsbury, who purchased innumerable pieces of pre and post medieval textile for the college at the request or perhaps in response to Pugin's museum. One of the most significant and oldest pieces of uh, pre Pugin textiles we have is a coat made for and worn by Cardinal Mortar mentor of the young Sir Thomas Moore, who was a page in Morton's household. The museum houses over 200 individual textile pieces. Some are single, usually tangibles. Others are part of a greater collection, such as the Waterford vestments, of which the majority remain in Ireland as a testimony to the faith of the country. And numerous pieces are later additions to the museum and compose the vestments which Fusion designed for use in the college chapel such as the gold coat on the screen at the moment. The collection covers woodwork, textiles, metalwork, ceramics, books, and one of the largest collections of pilgrim badges in England, and some frankly bizarre items. My favorite being a stump of wood excavated from a Romano British site at the River Thames, which was reputedly from a pile sunk into the Thames to oppose the Roman invasion in 58 BC. I'm not entirely convinced. The museum collection has been added to through the years by students, seminarians, priests, and members of staff. And whilst the focus of the collection shifted somewhat from Pugin's original vision, it remains true to his desire to inspire and teach. The collection now not only tells the story of Catholic faith in the British Isles, but also the story of Catholicism in, in Europe and the unique story of Oscott itself. It remains a living museum with artifacts often being removed from general display for use in the college chapel. The use of such historic artifacts in today's liturgies proves a tangible link to the faith of those who have gone before, whilst inspiring the faith of those present. A favourite piece from the collection which has been used 
for this very reason is a pectoral cross which was known to have been worn by the last abbot of Croyland before he and the remaining 27 monks of the order subscribed to the oath of supremacy and surrendered the abbey to the monarchy in 1539. The cross, later passed into the hands of Bishop John Milner and subsequently onto Bishop Ullathorne, and the piece has remained a key item in the college's collection ever since. And it was a favourite item of the now Cardinal of Westminster, Vincent Nichols, whilst he was Bishop in Birmingham. When he left Birmingham to become Cardinal, college trustees had the cross replicated as a gift to, for him, adding to a new chapter of this artefact's fascinating history and continuing the legacy that Eugene had created in the College Museum. Such collections as those found at Oscott contain the permanent memory, memory of Christianity and the Catholic Church share Eugene's view that the, one of the most important functions of the museum is raising awareness of contemporary generations and in particular young people. In 2011, a paper was written by the Vatican stating this view and emphasizing that in the current world, such collections must not be hidden away, but made accessible to all people of all faiths and none. Even before the pandemic, there was a growing desire to remember where we came from and a recognition of the impact of faith in our lives. And much like Pugin, the art and architecture of churches acted as an anchor in troubling times. It was seen that much as Pugin saw the need to look back during, during the Victorian period, so too do we now need to consider where we've come from in the 21st century. If nothing else, if the building doesn't stand, it is clear that Pugin's legacy would still very much remain with us today due to that very sentiment. As it is, we are very lucky that the college chapel he endowed us with, along with the museum and his memory, keep the Catholic faith, his belief, and his story alive. Thank you. I can hear um, people across Sutton, Coalfield and beyond applauding you, Naomi. <laughs> and and uh, that was just a, a really fascinating talk and I'm very grateful uh, to you for that. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions have started coming through and please do now use the Q&A uh, button to submit any questions you've got for Naomi. Um, the first question that's come up um, is from Keith and he's asked whether Pugin had any relation with Cardinal Newman and the Birmingham Oratory. Um, they certainly would have crossed paths but no, um, Pugin had very much left the college by the time that Newman appears um, so uh, I don't know how many people are aware, so forgive me if I'm uh, covering known history, uh, but the Cardinal Newman was received into the Catholic Church in Oscott's uh, own chapel. So certainly there is a tangible link in that sense, uh, but no, Pugin had very much moved on and onto bigger projects, including the Houses of Parliament, um, redesigned by the time Newman sort of comes to Birmingham, to Oscar, uh, and then subsequently onto the Oratory in Birmingham. Thank you. Um, then there's an anonymous question here about um, uh, you, Joseph Potter, the architect or the who was working on the Richard site uh, yeah. before um, uh, Pugin. What other buildings are there nearby? Uh, near well, Richard? he did a lot of work in Litchfield. So um, the apse, uh, the west end of Litchfield Cathedral was completely redeveloped by um, by Potter uh, and most of the churches in and around Litchfield uh, were either designed by or uh, had major alterations uh, by Joseph Potter. Um, and that's probably the most um, substantial collection of buildings that we've got a tangible link to. Uh, it's still left in the local area, uh, so yeah. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll have to go and visit those as well. And that links very nicely to the next question, which is uh, from Denise. Is it possible to visit uh, the Chaplain Museum at Oscott? Uh, and uh, I'll put in brackets, in, in, in non-COVID times. Yeah, I was going to say, in normal times, we would be delighted to open the doors. Um, do keep an eye on the college's uh, website uh, in normal times. And we hope, therefore, from sort of September onwards, uh, we do public tours on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, they take about two and a half hours. 
Uh, and you see not only the chapel and the museum, but also other areas of the college building. And as all good tours should do, we finish with homemade tea and cake. So uh, yeah, we, we normally open for business, uh, but do keep them on the college website. As soon as we have new dates, they'll be on there. Fantastic. Uh, I feel um, there might be a little reunion of people tonight coming to the first one. I can, I and I'd be delighted to welcome you through. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so Marion's asked, how much was Pugin influenced by other medievalists, for example, William Morris um, or, or other medievalists of the time? Not massively, although there is evidence of cross conversation and cross uh, connection. Um, but Pugin was really quite singularly minded in what he thought uh, should be the revival style, uh, the Gothic Revolution, um, and pretty much everything he, he published was a, this is how we're currently doing it wrong and this is how we should be doing it. Um, so he wasn't particularly swayed or influenced by the views and the visions of uh, others. Um, but the businesses and the connections that he made, people like Hardman, like Minton, obviously work closely with a lot of other um, architects uh, of the period. And so there probably was a lot of kind of cross design, cross comparison uh, conversations happening, um, even if it wasn't sort of an intentional sit down um, discussion of views. Um, but as I say, Pugin pretty much was nonstop. I'm not convinced the guy ever slept. So um, certainly didn't have time for lots of extensive conversations with people of opposing views to him yeah okay interesting interesting um Anne's asked uh what other churches did Pugin design uh and I'll, I'll just sort of put in brackets that, that we might be able to go and visit so sort of within you know yeah the, okay it's, uh, in, it's in particular did he um design Sutton Holy Trinity so the Catholic Holy Trinity I, I imagine Anne means and if yeah. not him do, can you tell us anything of the the, the arch architectural history of, of that building okay so no Pugin didn't design holy the Catholic holy trinity um either holy trinity is actually let's just get this right he doesn't design either of them um, sadly, the, the local Sutton church he designed no longer stands. He designed the original St. Nick's in Baldmere, uh, which subsequently got pulled down for the building that we now have today. Um, there is a massive list of Pugin's architectural work that you can go and visit, but sort of the big one is Cheadle. Uh, Cheadle is called Pugin's Masterpiece. Uh, it's also the church that bankrupts the 16th Earl of Shrewsbury. Um, because Pugin just goes over the, over the top with it and the bill is astronomical. Uh, but Cheadle is really worth going to visit. Uh, and I recommend when life is back to normal, you do so. Um, he also designed St. Chad's Cathedral, which is the Roman Catholic Cathedral in the center of Birmingham. Um, but uh, actually if you uh, search for, um, if you literally Google Pugin churches, uh, you will find the extensive list is like, a hundred uh, about 128 churches that had some Pugin link be it him or his two sons who both went into the architectural uh, business um, but can off the top of my head the two local are St Chad's and uh, St Giles Tudor yeah can I just uh, make sure I've understood that you're saying that the original St Nick's design was a Pugin yeah so the original St Nick's in bold me uh, uh, St Nicholas's uh, I'll get told off for not calling and get my oh. prop title. Uh, it's fine. Um, yeah, the original St. Nicholas is when it was built was a Pugin, uh, Pugin church. And it was a tiny little chapel originally, it only sat about 50, 60 people. It was then extended to see uh, more like 150. And then that was subsequently uh, pulled down and the building that is there and everybody knows um, on the main road was then created. So yeah, we, we sort of lost our really local Pugin church. And, and so was, does, is that indicative of a period when Pugin wasn't perhaps recognised in the way that he is now? I mean, because you can't imagine pulling down, even if it wasn't fit for purpose, even if you wanted a bigger building nowadays, you wouldn't pull down a, a, a tiny Pugin to, to make way for it. So Yeah, so Pugin really gets written out of the architectural history books for a very long period. He, it's only sort of, the late 1990s, early 2000s, that Pugin really gets this recognition and revival um, in architectural circles and his name sort of 
become synonymous with Gothic revival and these grandiose churches and chapels that still exist. Um, and really that he gets re-recognised for his input uh, of the House of Parliament at Westminster as well, because he very much gets written out of that particular story. Um, uh, and there's no real logical reason for why his name gets uh, written out of the history books and why he's overlooked for all the work that he does, but it happens. Um, and uh, so, yeah, churches, they were just sort of either deemed not fit for purpose or too ornate or just too much work for upkeep and so yeah they were pulled down sadly um yeah i don't think there'd be many pugin churches now that aren't listed or wouldn't raise an uproar if we pulled them down do you um at the college or do you know if there are any photographs or illustrations of that original st nicholas's um or where we could go and look at them not to my knowledge we um we have some architectural drawings uh, and sketches of the extended chapel housed at um, the archives in Birmingham, at, at the Archdiocesan Archives in Birmingham, but I'm not aware of any images of the, the original, the true original Pugin uh, chapel, I'm afraid, no. Okay, I, I feel an exciting um, little research project coming on there, because I think lots of people here tonight would like to, to have a, a see an illustration of what that original tiny chapel look like so um Naomi I might be back in touch quite soon to see what we can Just do let me on know. that one. <laughs> okay so the next question um is from Timothy and he would like to know are there any direct connections between Pugin and JC Buckler now I'm afraid I don't know who JC Buckler is but uh I'm I'm you're... not aware of any it's an it's a connection that I've looked into a couple of times um uh but I get to a little who who is who is um, Mr. Butler. Now I'm hoping we are talking about the same JC Butler. <laughs> um, but um, JC uh, Butler, or certainly the, the gentleman that I, I'm referring to, um, was uh, an architect as, um, from the same, well, slightly later in Pugin's life, but same period, uh, who was um, became quite synonymous with building uh, Catholic churches. Um, uh, certainly at home here in the UK, but also in Ireland. Um, but if that's not the same gen uh, gentleman that uh, Timothy is referring to, if he lets me know, I'm certainly happy to do some research and see if that's um, uh, if I can find any connections for him. Yeah, great, Timothy. Um, I will have your email address through booking, so I'll be in touch afterwards, and we can we can connect uh, to follow that up if you'd like. Um, just a comment from Cathy. Uh, Cathy's been lucky enough to visit St, um, St. Mary's uh, and it, it was uh, even more fascinating than the talk this evening, which was great. So she really hopes everyone gets the opportunity to go. So uh, 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 we'll, we'll all try and take Cathy's advice. Um, Jeffrey uh, has asked, on the frontispiece of Contrasts, Pugin's name was recorded as A.W. Pugin. Why did he drop the N for Northcott? Northmore. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. There's, there's lots of Ns in this particular period of history. Uh, so yeah, it's Augustus Welby, Northmore Pugin. Um, Northmore was his mother's. Uh, it comes from his mother's side of the family, uh, and he just in A W Pugin sort of becomes um, his standard moniker or A W Pugin or A Pugin. Um, it's, it's, there's no particular reason he drops it other than it's a ridiculously long mouthful. Um, and it's only sort of due to the revi uh, revived interest of um, Pugin and, and him as an architect that people really kind of call him by his, his full title these days, yeah. Great. Um, then I've got a, a, a wonderful bit of crowdsourcing information. So Richard Morris has kindly uh, let us know that St Nicholas's website has a picture of the original chapel. So there please don't leave us to go and Google that and look at it. You can go and look at that in five, ten minutes time when we're in time. And I'll be emailing the vicar after this asking whether we can get a copy done so that it can go into the archive collection. <laughs> My work is never done. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, Francis has asked, have you witnessed the impact of the beautiful objects in the chapel or museum on children when they visit? 
Yeah, I mean, we're it, like everything, take this as in normal times. When we have children visit, um, we have an academic outreach program normally in June where we have eight days of 100 children through the doors every day. Um, and the, there's an almost revered silence when they go in. I mean, these are um, year five, year six for the most part that come to visitors. Um, and the college is alive with noise and hubbub and uh, excitement, as everyone would expect when you're away from school on a visit. And there's this sort of the minute they walk into the chapel, there's almost like this hushed silence comes upon them. Um, and they're in. I'm not saying all because I'm not I, I don't want to label them that way, but there's certainly a, a, a very evident impact of the space on them. Um, and they they ask some of the most intriguing questions and they want to get up close to everything. Um, so, yeah, it's a real tangible sort of um, visible uh, impact. Um, but having said that, I would say that probably 90 percent of our visitors who come to the college aren't, uh, aren't Catholic, haven't ever seen inside the college. And you almost get that same giddy response from them as well. Um, it's it's a truly special space. And uh, I, I know I'm very lucky that uh, in normal circumstances, I can walk into it on any given day. Yeah, it's your workspace. Um, so just talking about the, the kids, though, there's a little bit of the history that I wondered if you could pick apart from. Mm -hmm. You mentioned how um, the college is a seminary. Yeah. But I understand in the early days it was... School. a school for younger children uh for so not for for uh, student priests but just a, a a catholic school is that right and yeah could you tell us a little bit about so um specific education for uh, the, uh for catholics uh was very late in coming catholic centered schools um appear much later than um sort of the church of england state schools and if you were a practicing Catholic, you weren't entitled to go to a uh, Church of England state school. So you had an entire generation of um, children who, in theory, weren't receiving an education. Oscar school very much was uh, for young men of the elite class. Um, and it's there until 1888. Uh, and there's a great outcry, actually, when we have to uh, when the doors to the school close. Um, and it was simply because we were training too many priests that they had to close the, the school. Um, but the intent was not it, much like, um, I suppose, places like Eton and Harrow today. It was a place to build connections, but was also founded on the principle and the premise of uh, a devout Catholic faith. So everybody was uh, literally singing from the same hymn sheet. But these were kind of the big connections that you needed in order to succeed later in life. And uh, we're in the middle of doing a really big research project at the moment. Uh, there are 128 armorial windows in the college who are all um, the, the family shields of the boys who came to the school. And as we start researching uh, those boys who came through the doors, uh, and the connections, you realise that not only is there massive intermarriage across all these Catholic families, but these are the individuals that then go on to be um, like high in uh, the courts, they enter Parliament, they were captains um, uh, in most of the different regiments in the military, um, big landowners, uh, and therefore, um, especially the Irish families who were sending boys, very heavily involved when uh, we get the Irish famines and the uprisings. Um, so yeah, it was very much sort of a grounding, um, a grounding center for these young men to build the connections, which would see them through the rest of their lives. And, and those buildings that were, the school buildings are now part of the seminary, they're used as? They always, yeah, they always were. So the building as it stands now, let me find the plans. Um, okay, so if you uh, look at the bottom left hand corner, which is the, I do appreciate it's quite small, but that is the original plan. Uh, for those who have managed to uh, come to Oscar, you know it's actually slightly bigger than this now. There are three extensions that go onto the back of this original uh, floor plan. 
Um, one is the common room, one is what is known as Northcote Hall, which is our lecture hall, and the other is the library. But other than that, the building has remained identical to this uh, floor plan and design. So the school and the seminary simply operated side by side. One wing would have been the classroom for the boys, the other side would have had the priests, uh, the, those who were studying theology and, and the, for the priesthood probably would have had rooms on the other side. Um, but uh, no, they, they rubbed shoulders all the way through. And it was simply when there were more young men wanting to be trained as priests, college didn't have the capacity to house everybody and said so school was closed. Um, uh, can you comment at all on the grounds? So we've talked about the architectural buildings. Are the grounds <coughs> designed and... Uh, no, so uh, we, have, we have just over 50 acres left. Uh, many of you who are local are probably aware that we have a very large cemetery, um, uh, which is part of the college grounds, although you access it independently of the main college. The land that was purchased was more like 200 acres. It um, supported uh, multiple small farm holdings uh, as well as housing. Um, but the land was compulsory purchased through uh, by the city council in the uh, 70s and the 80s as buildings were needed and development happened. So the college sold the vast majority of its land uh, to the city council. Uh, and actually, if you look at any of the, um, if you look at the housing estate that sits directly below uh, the college, if you go down College Road and turn into the estate on the first left, all the roads around there are named after individuals of Catholic Church at that time. So I think there's a Pugin Close, there's a Walsh Road, there's a, a Northcote Drive, and it's all named after individuals who were influential in not only the re-establishment of the Catholic Church in Birmingham, but very much in the development of Oscar College. So uh, we lost the land, but the legacy lives on. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Kathy's just uh, want, wants to encourage people also, if, if they're interested in when it's possible, um, to go to Kent. Where, and she says you can go around Pugin's house in Ramsgate. Yes. And says that's a, a very special experience. So. Yeah, and I believe the chapel the private chapel there is is uh, now open to the public as well that's been closed for a little while having restoration work done on it so okay. an, another on everyone's long list of things to do when we can yeah. Yeah. travel <laughs> okay well that's it uh for tonight i think uh uh we've uh, answered everybody's questions that have come through this evening uh it's been really uh i mean i have to say i've never been to the college uh, i've been past it thousands of times on the bus <laughs> um, but now I'm really uh, extremely keen to come and look around it and 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 be in all probably uh, certainly uh, I'll appreciate it all with it with a new sense so uh, on behalf of everyone who's uh, come this evening uh, I, I'm sure that uh, all the audience would like to, me to thank you Naomi it's been a really fascinating talk uh, inspiring and exciting and, and great that it's right on our doorstep uh, and uh, I think also lots for us to go away that we'll want to follow up you know the different Pugin links um, some of them locals very local the the Litchfield links as well so that's always nice when you go away sort of excited about going to do do more and see see more so uh, on behalf of everyone thank you Naomi yeah you're welcome and, uh, thank you for Brilliant. Uh, so uh, it just remains for me to say to my audience uh, this evening, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you will stay safe and stay well. I hope many of you will join us uh, in a fortnight's time for our talk on the archaeology of Sutton. Uh, now, if um, please, uh, I'd invite you to 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 go and do whatever's next on your your plan for the evening. Uh, Naomi and I have to stay online just to uh, briefly wrap up our evening. But um, if you leave. Um, you'll get the uh, little brief survey that helps us plan our future events. So thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>